A lot of your business is tied to the global economic cycle. Let's shorten that time horizon. So over the longer term, things look okay. What does the next 12 months look like to you? Like, what assumptions is the bank making? Yeah, so for us, so just for people watching, I mean, our business internationally is intermediating trade and capital flow. So our mm. customers move things and money around mostly Asia Pacific. You're a trade bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we, we facilitate that, mm. you know, whether that's doing currency trades for them or the actual trade itself. So we get a lot of data in there. Look. It's still very stable. I mean, what we've seen, particularly with the dominance of China and a lot of those trade flows, that has diminished just a little bit, uh, particularly if you're talking about Australia, New Zealand, part of the world. So we've got more and more diversified places that we're trading with, whether it's a Thailand or a Vietnam or increasingly in India. So our business is shifting, if that makes sense, sort of geographically quite fast, as a pot. but overall, total volumes that, that we're seeing are more or less the same, pretty flat. But there's quite a big shift under the covers there between uh, various countries. Mm. So that you know, we, we need to respond to that as a bank. You know, so we need so we're building out our capability in places like India mm. or like right. Vietnam to help with that capacity as we see those those trade flows and capital flows shift. Which brings me to my next one: your your commitment in the mainland in some ways. Obviously, ANZ has retreated from Mike Smith's old kind of super regional strategy, yep. which meant heavy capital investment into China. What is the business strategy in the mainland for you guys now? So I think on some measures we're still Australia's largest investor in mainland China. We've got about 300 people there. We, I mean, we're an on-the-ground business. We actually have people. We do things on the ground. We're not just right. selling things um, for, uh, remotely. We will go where our customers need us. As I say, we intermediate trade and capital flow. We deal with the world's largest companies, whether they're from the United States, European, Australian or Chinese. And, you know, where, where they need us, we go. So right now, there is still an enormous demand for our services on mainland China. You know, our business there is growing, uh, not shrinking. Um, same here in Hong Kong, and we'll continue to invest in our platforms and capabilities um, in Hong Kong and, and, of course, in mainland China. I mean, the retreat from Asia sort of got overblown a little bit, you know, the retreat <laughs> from the super regional strategy. That was, by and large, retreating from a retail banking strategy, which, yeah. you know, we just didn't have a scale to compete in that. So institutional banking, which is what we do particularly well, mm. that is continuing to grow. And in fact, from our perspective and from our shareholders' perspective, even more importantly, the profitability of that business has significantly improved. I mean, eight years ago when I started, our uh, international franchise had an ROE of sort of 3%. Yeah. Today, it's mid-teens and really, really sustainable. And What and more can you do outside of Australia in the institutional business to expand? Well, we've got a strategy that follows our customers. We have 6,500 institutional customers globally. Big chunk of those are other financial institutions. Most of them are the world's best multinationals, and we go where they go. And so, as they move, as I said, if they, you know, we know the China Plus One strategy has been intact for quite a while, and as they're out there wanting to invest more in Vietnam and, and, and India, but also places like Japan, we follow. So we go there as well, and we build our capacity to follow um, to follow them. You mentioned six and a half thousand institutional investors. Yeah. I mean, that number has shrunk. Substantially, yeah. From I think nearly thirty thousand. Correct. Does that number stay, or do you see that falling even further? No, I don't think it'll fall further. I think it's pretty stable. Okay. There may be a little bit of growth in there. I don't, we certainly have no ambition to reduce it. I mean, our strategy. You know, we're pretty comfortable. We've got the right six and a half thousand. There'll always be people we need to add to the list. Yeah. But no, no. We, we that is about the right scale. Um, for us, I mean, institutional banking is a risky business. You take a lot, you know, we've got a lot of balance sheet out to those customers, and you know, our philosophy is we'd rather sort of know these people really, really well. And six and a half thousand is about a number you can get your head around and and know certainly the big end of that list, literally intimately, and know them really, really well. Uh, what about your non-core international divestments? Mm. Right, you did uh, recently cut your stake in Ambank. You haven't quite found a buyer for Pen and Bank just yet. I mean, what's the outlook there? So we only have the, we have three uh, what we call partnership uh, stakes. So they were minority investments. We've actually sold quite a few over the years, but yes, we've just sold 16 and a half percent of Ambank. We've made it very clear they don't really have a place in our portfolio or our strategy going forward. So you know we are we are actively looking uh, to find alternative buyers for those. So it's something that we spend a bit of time on. It was a good step forward for us to sell the Ambank state. We're really pleased with that. We had a great relationship, but we need to move on. They need to move on, and they're better to have a more stable shareholders. Yeah. Pannon, same thing. We work really closely with our partner shareholders, but we'll look for a solution there, and then we have a small stake in China, uh, Bank of Tianjin. Mm. 
And, and on those two, Pan and Bank and Bank of Tianjin, do you have a timeline for that? Is there an ideal time where you think... I, I, I wish I did in the sense that I don't get to control the timeline on those things. I mean, look... Well, what would you like to see, ideally, oh, for you? we would like... I, we are not helpful shareholders, if I'm being very honest, to either of those parties. You know, we, we, our strategy has changed. You know, we don't have the resources to really lean in okay. and contribute to either. So we're probably more of a problem for them than, than not. So the time, at, you know, if I'm being totally honest. And so, look, I think the sooner we can just find more appropriate shareholders who can actually help, because yeah. both are good franchises and they need somebody who's going to lean in as a supportive partner. Not to say we're not supportive, but I just don't think we're the best shareholder. Uh, for either party. So the, the sooner we can clean those things up, I think, the better. Yeah, I mean, domestically, you, you, the court cleared this takeover of mm. Suncorp for you guys, which is obviously good news for ANZ. Are you expecting more consolidation in the banking space? I expect that that, I mean, we still have over 100 banks in Australia. A lot of them are very, very small. The reality, and it's down over time. I mean, the reality is globally, and particularly in Australia, banking is a scale game. And it's a scale game largely because of regulation, compliance, things like cyber security and all of those, you need real scale to be able to service your customers well in a world of technology. Mm. And you know, that makes it more and more difficult for the small and the region, what we call the regional banks and the mid-size, the people who've got, you know, two, three, four percent market share, yeah. it becomes more difficult. I mean, I'll give you an interesting stat. ANZ, we spend more on cyber security than Suncorp spends on all of its technology, right? So it just gives you a sense of the sort of scale you're talking about. You know, you can't say to your customers, we're slightly less secure, but that's okay because we're small. You, you, you know, there's a, there's a minimum bar. You yeah. have to be at the top of your game. And so I think scale is becoming more and more important. That's not to say there is not a very, very important role for regional banks who find a point of, you know, a niche, a specialisation, something they can do very, very well. And, you know, some of them are doing um, quite well. well. But I think there will be further consolidation. You... You're sitting on some, some cash, right? Yep. You, you, you've raised some cash and divestments and, you know, some of the capital requirements that you now have a, you know, a representative office you have that money to. And I'm wondering whether you're looking at using that for any acquisitions you mentioned. We talked about consolidation. Mm -hmm. Are you actively looking to buy assets in Australia? No, not really. I mean, Suncorp is a big one for us. This is $4.9 billion. I mean, we, this, is, this is, from our perspective a really high quality asset and you know we, we really firmly believe we'll be able to drive better outcomes for their customers once they're part of the ANZ uh, stable. Mm -hmm. We've got our hands full doing that. These things are complicated as you can imagine. We've got to move 1.2 million customers from Suncorp Bank across yeah. into our systems. That'll keep us busy. Remember we're also doing our own work. We've essentially launched a whole new bank in Australia called ANZ Plus which is a you know digital through and through platform. Really exciting. And we are migrating all our customers onto there. So we've got a hands full. We've already got 650,000 customers onto that platform, which is really exciting. So we've got, we got a lot on. No, we're not actively out looking for acquisitions in Australia. Mm. We always keep an eye open. You never know. You've got, to, you've got to stay close to the ground, particularly here in Asia, where things move really quickly. Um, but there's nothing actively being pursued at this point. I was going to ask you about overall succession plans. I mean, you are the longest serving CEO, uh, Australian banking CEO. You're eight years at the helm. Is there a succession plan in place? There's always been a succession plan. I mean, globally, I'm still a baby. Eight years, that's nothing. Um, I'm only just getting started. Oh, look, I, uh, succession planning is something the board and I take very seriously. Obviously, as time goes by, you take it more seriously, uh, as you can imagine. So, look, we're very lucky at ANZ. We've built a really fantastic cadre of leaders. Many of them have sat in the chair here, actually. You've met some of them. Yes. So we've got a good talent pipeline of, of business leaders, etc. So that's my job, is to make sure that when the time comes, the board has the best possible uh, choice. And, you know, Would you I'm like confident. to stay longer? I love, like my I, love yeah. the, I love the job. I love doing what I'm doing. I feel very privileged to lead such a great organisation. And as I said, I'm still really energised about it. There's, I mean, I say to a lot of our young people, actually, when you sign up for banking, you are signing up for change. I mean, the industry is changing really, really fast, and you have to be excited about that change and the opportunities that new technology brings. You know, the latest thing we're all talking about, obviously, generative AI, and that's going to, you know, that's going to fundamentally reshape the landscape of banking. I find that stuff interesting. I yeah. find it exciting, and, you know, as I said, it's a privilege to lead the, the group.